In the book of Romans, God, like a master architect, lays out his incredible plan of salvation. Using the apostle Paul, God sketches out the blueprint of the good news of Jesus Christ for all mankind. The same news that turned Paul from a murderous persecutor of Christians into a fervent follower of Christ himself. With great passion, Paul uses the themes righteousness, condemnation, justification, salvation, sanctification, glorification, sovereignty, and transformation among others to unpack the details of a simple yet incredible gift, the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel message found in this letter has changed millions of lives since it was written thousands of years ago, and its timeless truth has made enemies of God into friends of God, and dead people into resurrected people. It will no doubt point you as well to the source of salvation, Jesus, Savior and Lord, the cornerstone of God's perfect blueprint. Well, good morning, Journey Madison. We are diving into the Word today, and we are in week 19 of our series through the book of Romans. If you're joining us new this morning, uh, we started this series in January of 2020, and we're going to go all year, and we're going to go through the entire book of Romans. It's about about 36 sermons in total, and it's so exciting to be able to uh, go through the Word of God verse by verse uh, together. So open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 is where we're going to be this morning, and the verses we're going to cover are Romans uh, 10, 1 through 13. Romans 10, 1 through 13. Uh, this is going to be an exciting sermon. I'm really excited because we're talking all about salvation. We're talking about salvation's call, and and it's, it's, it's really exciting to be able to dig into this section in Romans, which has a lot of very famous verses. Now, if you're new to Christianity, you think, how is a verse famous? Well, some verses are used more than other verses. Uh, not that they're more important or less important. They're just used more because they mean a lot to people. And so Romans 10 has some really great verses in it. So open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. And uh, we're going to intro a little bit here. So remember, the book of Romans is all about the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God means God always does what is right. And God always keeps his promises. God always does what is right, and God always keeps his promises. Now, the past two weeks, we looked at the sovereignty of God and why God, uh, who, looked, who chose the Jews as his chosen people, uh, why God actually branched out and did he offered salvation to more than just the Jews, but also why didn't the Jews respond to God? And so Paul answered that question or began answering that question in Romans chapter 9. Now, Paul continues answering it in Romans 10 and 11, and that's where we find ourselves today, where Paul is answering a question of if, if God's call to salvation is so big and so grand, and if the Jewish people had all of God's promises, then why didn't they respond? And what is God's further plan for both Jews and Gentiles? And this was important because the book is called Romans, which means Paul's writing to Christians in Rome, and these Christians in Rome uh, many of them were not Jewish because the Jews were all expelled from Rome at a certain time, then they came back. And so now you have a whole community learning how to grapple with uh, two different cultures, two really dynamic cultures, all loving Jesus, but like how do we interact, how do we work well together? So uh, that's where we find ourselves in the book of Romans and then specifically in Romans 10. And some of the things I thought about as I looked at this text is salvation's call. So salvation's call is really uh, the, the whole point of here in Romans 10. And, and I thought about this. I thought, have you ever gotten a call that changed your life? Have you ever gotten a call that changed your life? And I think about uh, there's certain phone calls that I received that radically changed my life. I remember uh, the call that, uh, that I got from one of my mentors. His name is John Dirks. And the call came when, uh, when I was um, at uh, Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington, 
Uh, I had visited his church in Spokane, and he told me all about an internship, and he called me when I was in Bellingham, and he said, I would love to have you be a part of the internship. It was a phone call and changed my life because I ended up uh, moving schools, transferred schools from Western Washington University to Eastern Washington University, and I ended up finishing my degree in music from Eastern and interned with John Dirks, all from that moment when I got a call from him saying, I'd love to have you come be my intern. I remember uh, I got a call. Uh, there was another time where I got a call that I didn't get the job. So I was really hoping to get a particular job. Uh, there was a church that I had applied for and I had interviewed for, and this is uh, many, many years ago, almost 10 years ago, and, uh, and I didn't get the job. And I remember it was so dynamic what, what happened in that call where instead of just saying, uh, hey, you didn't get the job. There was, there was like coaching and shepherding and care as they spoke to me about uh, my qualifications and the ways that I needed to grow. Uh, phone calls, the, the call that you get, calls that you get, they made a big impact on our life. Now, salvation's call is big. It's, it's a call that comes to us both through a person, but also spiritually through the Holy Spirit. And and what, and what we are diving into today is both of those things, this, this call that comes from an individual, but also this call that comes from God to say, be reconciled to God, be saved. And lest you think we're, we're moving away from God's sovereignty, because this whole section in Romans 9, 10, and 11 talks a lot about sovereignty, we're not moving away, we're just getting very individual. Where Romans 9 talked about grand uh, I, I think more theological, philosophical aspects of the sovereignty of God. Uh, Romans 10 now gets real personal about the sovereignty of God. Uh, so we're really going to look at how does this impact us as individuals for salvation. So Romans 10, here we go. 1 through 13, starting in verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved they may be saved. The Jews may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Verse 5, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim, which we've talked about so much now, Romans 1 through 9, faith, 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 Faith is how we come uh, to God. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek, or Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. And this verse theme, verse 13 so famous. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Powerful, powerful verses here this morning. Our first point is this. Salvation is for everyone. Salvation is for everyone. And as we look at the text, what we see is this, is... Uh, Brothers, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for them is that they may be saved, for I bear witness. Now, he's saying brothers in, in Rome, all of these Christians, it's a general term. Uh, women, it would be like, hey, everybody. Uh, so brothers, my heart's desire. The Jews, he wants his brothers, he wants all of the, the Jewish people to be saved. And what he means by they're ignorant uh, they don't have full knowledge, is that we talked about it last week at the end of Romans 9, that the Jews stumbled over this stumbling block of self-righteousness, of thinking they had to earn their way to God. And Tim Keller tells us what the gospel is in a very succinct way of saying, uh, the gospel is I'm accepted, therefore I obey, but uh, self-righteousness is I obey, therefore I'm accepted. And what the Jews stumbled over is that they thought they needed to be obedient and to be accepted, not realizing that the gospel said, You're, I'm accepted in Jesus, therefore I obey. Verse 4 is really key here in Romans 10. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who does good works. 
No, to everyone who believes, to everyone who believes. Paul is again broken for the Jews. He makes a point to share his heart. Uh, Paul here it really uh, goes deep in saying that all of the benefits of Jesus' righteousness, all of them, everything that Jesus has comes to us through faith and belief. And, and his hope, he points this out because he's saying his hope for his Jewish brethren, his hope for everyone is not that people would behave rightly. It's not that people would do the right thing. It's that people would put their faith in Jesus. And it's now available to everyone. And I love this because as, as we think about our own life, as we think about the people in our life, as we think about uh, the, the, the times when we feel like we've done a b- bunch of bad things, is God still going to accept us? Or maybe you have someone in your life who says, no, I'm just a bad person. They've defined themselves by the things they've done. We can come to them with great hope saying, no, uh, verse 4 tells us, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. A law for righteousness. We can never earn our way to God. And man, that is good news for people to hear. It's good news for us to tell ourselves every day. Where's your belief at? Where's your faith at? Which does get us to our second point, which is salvation is attained by faith. Salvation is for everyone. It's available to everyone, but it's attained by faith. Salvation is attained by faith. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. Now, if you're new to Christianity, Moses uh, was a leader in the Old Testament. He was a prophet and a leader, and he led the Jews out of slavery in the book of Exodus. And he wrote many of the books of the Bible. So in the Old Testament, Moses wrote a lot of the books of the Bible. Uh, So he's a big deal. So for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. This is a little confusing. We'll get there. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend in the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim because if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. How can you be saved? Confess with your mouth that Jesus is is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. All of us get the reward of what we put our faith in. All of us get the reward of what we put our faith in. Government, you put your faith in government, you're gonna get the reward of of that government. Faith in a leader, you're going to get the reward of that. Now, here's the reality of our faith. When I'm talking about faith here, I'm not talking about um, that kind of the simple faith of like, I put my faith in a chair and that's why I sit in the chair. And, and therefore, you know, if I can't say I have faith in the stability of that chair, if I don't sit in it, we're talking about like deep heart issues of faith And the reality of our world around us today is things are more divisive, things are more separated than ever before because we have forgotten that our hearts, our minds, our our souls are meant for worship. And what, what is happening in our world today, if you're wondering like, why are things stratified? Why are things really divisive? Well, at at its core, there's a worship issue. And, And leaders and friends and spouses and um, governments, they were never meant to hold the weight of your worship. See, when you, you are constantly worshiping, you're constantly pouring your life out to something, you were made in God's image and you're a worshiper. And so everything, uh, body, soul, spirit is being poured out all the time. And when you pour that out to your wife or your husband, when you pour that out to a, a leader in some way, they can never carry the weight of that Worship. The only person who carries the weight of your worship is Jesus. It's the only person. That's what Paul's alluding to here when he says um, so, some people are like bringing Christ up or bringing Christ down. Um, they, they're trying to make Jesus something that they can manage rather than saying, no, the word's near you. It's in your heart. It's right here. You can't manage Jesus. You come to Jesus and receive his grace and step onto the narrow road that leads to life. So the question is, what are you putting your faith in? Any object of your faith but Jesus will result in death. 
any object you put your faith in but Jesus is going to result in death. Now, you may say, yeah, I put my faith in all these things, Pastor Stephen, and I didn't just, you know, die. I understand that. It's going to produce death in your life. It's going to produce um, ultimately like spiritual decline in your life because Jesus is the only one that can carry the weight of your worship. The righteous live by faith in Jesus. Faith alone in Jesus' finished work. None of our own works, only Jesus' finished work. We don't have to wait for Jesus to go back to heaven to finish, which again is alluding to back to this text of saying, some of you want to bring Christ up to heaven or take him down. Jesus is finished. You don't have to, Jesus doesn't have to go back to heaven. Jesus doesn't go have to back to the grave again. He's with us. He's present. He's near. There's not more work that needs to be done by Jesus. He's done it all. The work is finished. And now we put our faith in his finished work. And, and what Paul is meaning here too is that the Jews were looking for more work to do, more things to happen when the reality is it's already happened, the work is done, and faith has been fully put, uh, and now we can put our full faith in Jesus. Here's the other part is that faith looks like something. Faith looks like something. And this is where, uh, w- what does it say? Uh, verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So this is so easy. It's so practical. Well, easy is the wrong word. Uh, It's not easy. It's simple, and simple things can be hard. So faith looks like something. What does faith look like? It looks like confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. If you have faith in Jesus, you'll confess he is the Lord of your life. He is the king. He is the sovereign. He is the ruler over your life. Why do we need to confess this with our mouth? Well, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Luke 6, 45. That words coming out of our mouth communicates what's really in our heart. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You see, in the Bible, the heart speaks to the center of our being, the intersection of body, soul, spirit. So when Paul here says, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. To believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead is is Paul saying, body, soul, spirit, everything that is a part of you needs to believe in Jesus. And you confess with your mouth that he's Lord and then believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that Jesus actually is alive today. He defeated your greatest enemy of Satan, sin, and death by rising again from the grave. If you do that, but confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from yourself and your own self-righteousness, saved from the evil in the world. Have you done this? Have you done this? Have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead because God wants you to be saved today. Christian, this is not something you do to get resaved every day. It's something you do because you love the name of Jesus, because you can't help but speak the name of Jesus. I encourage you to talk about Jesus every day. Talk about Jesus as you're in your comings and your goings all around your life. And we talked about when we sang the blessing earlier, there's a sense of like, may the Lord bless you and keep you and, and your comings and your goings. And in the evening, in the morning, we should be talking about the goodness of God and the love of God and, and the grace of Jesus in our life. Which leads to the final point. Salvation is in Jesus alone. Verse 11, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Wow. I mean, when you think about that, how many times have you put your faith in something and then you felt ashamed because that thing let you down or you felt ashamed because it couldn't wear the weight of your worship? For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I I love this passage. I love this section because it's so clear and it's so helpful because when I think, oh my gosh, I don't know if that person can be saved. They, They seem beyond God's redemption. Now, would I ever verbalize that? No, but you know what? Those thoughts come into our mind because we think, again, we get self-righteous. We, get, we put ourselves in a place where we think we're down a road with Jesus who may be better than others, but we're not better than others. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on the name of the Lord. 
One of the things I say to my boys every day is that they are blessed and highly favored. When they grumble, have a bad attitude, or remind them, you are blessed and highly favored, boys. You are blessed, highly favored. Why? Because they're in Jesus. Because they love Jesus and they are blessed and highly favored. Because they live in a home that, that has God's kingdom coming into it every day. And here Paul tells us again that although the Jews were originally given the promises of God, those promised for ev- those promises were for everyone, Jew and Gentile. So the Jews thought those promises were only for them, but God is saying, no, it's the promises were given, yes, to the Jews, but now the promise of salvation goes out. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew or Greek anymore. There, there used to be a distinction between Jews and Greeks, but now regarding salvation, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. And I, I want to say here, because the Bible does it throughout scripture, there are sections where uh, the Bible seems to emphasize race and emphasize the distinctions of race, especially when you go to the book of Revelation, it says that in heaven, every tribe, tongue, and nation will be with us. See, the Bible tells us that we're made in God's image. And I believe that God made all different skin colors, all different um, cultures and races, because um, all of those cultures and races, all of those skin tones, they they show the wondrous um, variety of God and that God is so vast that no one race could just show who God is. But all of us in heaven together, every tribe, tongue, and nation bears witness to just the vastness and the beauty of God himself. So God is not Uh, God is not saying through Paul here that now race doesn't matter. No, he's saying ethnicity is important, but regarding salvation, your ethnicity is not important because salvation is for everyone. And if you're a a Gentile, if you're a non-Jew thinking, oh, we're more important than Jews, nope, you're not. And if you're Jew thinking, I'm more important than Gentiles, nope, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We learned in Romans 2, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. So as we talk about salvation, I want you to remember that within this, uh, God, is not, God is not wanting to put us in a place where we, uh, where we think he's coming to get us, where we think that God wants to judge us. No, God's kindness is always leading us to repentance. And that's good news because if you're watching this and you're thinking, I done a lot of bad things. And do I need to face judgment first before coming to God? No, the Father will reach out to you with kindness and Jesus takes all the punishment that you deserve on himself and then gives you his righteousness. The only special thing you need is Jesus. To cry out to God, to cry out to Jesus. And so I invite you to cry out to Jesus today. Call on the name of the Lord. Cry out to Jesus and be saved today. Cry out to Jesus to experience freedom today. Cry out to Jesus to experience life today. Cry out to Jesus to be healed today. Cry out to Jesus to be cleansed today. Cry out to Jesus to find comfort today. Christian, You need to cry out to Jesus every day, every moment of your day. You need to ask God. You need to come to Jesus. We have a phrase, we we have a term in our culture, the come to Jesus moment, the moment when everything changes. Now, if you're a Christian, you've had that literal come to Jesus moment, but I would encourage you, have that moment every day. Not where you're resaved, but you just rekindle that relationship with God and and his power and his presence Have that come to Jesus moment every day of your life, multiple times a day. And if you're watching this and you don't know Jesus, you you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I invite you, trust in Jesus today. Come to Jesus today. Repent of your sins today. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. And some of you have been crying out to everything and everyone but Jesus. Nothing has worked. Cry out to Jesus today. Paul wanted his people, the Jews, to cry out to Jesus. He wants us this morning to cry out to Jesus 
to be saved. So let's relook at our points. Salvation is for everyone. Salvation is attained by faith. And then salvation is in Jesus alone. Salvation is in Jesus alone. Not our works, not our good thoughts, but in Jesus alone, where, where we repent of our sins and Jesus takes our sin, takes it from us, gives us his righteousness and makes us new from the inside out. That is good news. Christian, cry out to Jesus. If you're here, if you are watching this and you do not know Jesus, cry out to him. Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, King, Sovereign, Savior. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. I believe there are people who are getting saved right now as they watch this. Let's reach our city. Let's reach our neighborhood because here's the deal. Everyone you want to reach is online. Everyone you want to reach in our city, in your neighborhood, they're all online. And there's no, there's no limit to the power of God in a physical presence or in a digital presence. God is not limited by those things because God created all of what we use digitally or physically or practically. So Christian, I encourage you, spread the word. Spread the word. Salvation is for everyone. And that's what we're going to get into next week as we look more into Romans 10 of this, this, this now call in our life, not only to be saved, but then to spread the word to others. And we're going to talk about spreading the good news. I'm so excited to do that. And I'm so excited for those of you who have heard this word this morning and gotten saved. So uh, Christian, I am so glad that you uh, are watching this and uh, journey. This is such a, an amazing text for us to be in this morning. Let's do something. Let's uh, receive communion together this morning. So uh, I need, I'm just going to need a cracker. So I'm going to have uh, one of my sons grab me a cracker and, uh, and then we're going to take communion this morning. So uh, take your time, get a cracker and get some juice. I have some juice here and I'm going to have a cracker. And what communion is, as we close our sermon, is communion is remembering the body and the blood of Jesus. That uh, the body of Jesus, thank you, Patrick, the body of Jesus is signified by the cracker that he, his body was broken for us. That all the sin that, that we've committed, that we deserve God's wrath for, Jesus takes on himself. So as you look at this cracker, you think, this is, this is Christ's body broken for me so that my body didn't have to be broken. Let's take the cracker this morning and remember. And juice or water, or milk or whatever you have, signifies the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And the, even the act of communion is a calling out to Jesus, a calling out to God, save me once again. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I know every day I want more of that cleansing. So let's take the juice this morning and remember that cleansing. Pray with me. Jesus, we thank you this morning that you... God, you have saved us. Salvation is for everyone. Salvation is only found in you, Jesus. And we love you. And we are so grateful, God. It's not about our works. It's not about um, our, our good deeds at all. Any of our righteousness is, is, doesn't do anything for us. God, thank you that you can bear the full weight of our worship as we pour our lives and our hearts out to you. I thank you for those who heard this this morning and were saved. I thank you for those who, who heard this and have now a rekindled relationship with you, Jesus, and they're, they're realizing that you're gonna heal them just as we've received communion. I believe that you've healed people. I believe that you're changing lives right now as people are remembering once again to call out to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Thank you, Jesus, for saving this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to even share your word. Salvation is for everyone. Thank you. In your name, Jesus, amen.